It's a joy to be with you here on the octave of Easter. Uh, what a what a joyous time uh, as, as believers in our Lord Jesus Christ, and uh, to be at the uh, uh, chapel of St. Thomas Aquinas and to uh, celebrate St. Thomas More. Uh, we're just so honored to be here, uh, and Your Excellency, thank you so much for hosting us today for your Red Mass. Thank you, uh, Father, for your kindness to have me here at the Newman Center. Uh, you know, during, uh, in, in my diocese, we have Bishop Thomas Olmsted, who is a good friend of your bishops, and uh, during his uh, faithful service in our diocese, he is uh, known to visit the Catholic schools on a regular basis and check on what's going on. And on one particular occasion, he decided to visit a kindergarten art class. And as he observed one little girl, uh, she was drawing something, and he was quite perplexed because he couldn't identify the image, which is probably not atypical for kindergartners. And he kindly asked her what it was she was drawing. And she very sweetly replied, she said, I'm drawing a picture of God. And uh, the bishop smiled at her and said, well, no one really knows what God looks like. And not missing a beat, the young lady replied, of course not, Your Excellency, but in a moment when I finish, the world will know what God looks like. <laughs> uh, as a citizen, a lawyer involved in public policy and litigation for over 50 years, all too often we've stepped in the fray to defend the oppressed and the mistreated and those subjected to di uh, discrimination. And as we've appeared before courts, not with judges like we have here, but as we've appeared before a court seeking justice, the protection of natural and civil law for our clients is affirmed in the Constitution, all too often our experience has been like waiting for the little girl's drawing to be completed. All too often we don't know what the law or our client's rights will look like until the drawing is finished. And that's not the way it was supposed to be, as you know, as lawyers. When our nation's founders wrote the Constitution, our Congress wrote the laws, they picked specific words that had a particular meaning at the time of their adoption. And it was those meanings that we all know were supposed to be applied. When the first Congress, uh, in, in response to uh, the demands of the American people, uh, wrote the Bill of Rights, especially the First Amendment, it was not to grant us any new rights, but to ensure that natural law, our inalienable rights granted to us by God, were not trampled on by the government. Unlike those living in tyrannies and monarchies, there was not supposed to be a mystery about how our Constitution was supposed to be applied, and we were not supposed to wait for judicial persons to finish their drawings before we understood the text or what our rights would look like. Because, as we know, the most essential purpose of our Constitution was to protect our liberty. And sadly, as we know, that has been forgotten or distorted by all too many. Scores of our fellow Catholic and Christian brothers and sisters have had to engage in legal battles to protect our liberty and these principles. And uh, the next test, there we go. As, as our Holy Father, Pope Benedict, said, these principles are not just truths of faith. They're inscribed in the human nature itself, common to humanity, to all people, rescinding any religious affiliation. So what I want to do for the next few minutes is tell some stories, review a little history, and update you on some of the good news as well as some of the serious concerns about our moment for marriage and the law. And I'm particularly focusing on marriage with you because of St. Thomas More and his incredible stand to defend God's plan for marriage and to challenge you to pray and to engage as is an appropriate thing. We're in a historic struggle over religious freedom and over the uh, ability to stand and defend these things. And as we begin, we all remember that marriage is a central sacrament in our Roman Catholic faith, and its definition is non-negotiable. Our catechism reminds us that God himself is the author of marriage, and it goes further to say that the well-being of society is closely bound up with the healthy state of conjugal and family life. And Jesus, of course, reaffirmed that plan for marriage in Matthew 19. And at many times and in many places since our Lord taught us these things, the definition of marriage and the celebration of the sacrament is between one man and one woman, the right to conscience and to believe and act 
has been a controversial and sometimes dangerous and even illegal thing. I always say, just ask John the Baptizer. Ask Thomas More. And we all remember that great scene from A Man for All Seasons, where the friend comes to Thomas and he says, can't you just sign the paper for friendship? Can't you just, you know, compromise a bit? And Thomas says, well, when you're in heaven, having followed your conscience, and when I'm in hell for following, or for not following mine, if I sign, would you care to join me? <laughs> and, uh, and we have a whole host of Catholic priests, lay religious martyrs, who have sacrificed great things to defend this institution. And we remember that not only as Catholics was, mar is, was marriage many times controversial, but even the fact of Roman Catholicism itself. Mass was forbidden, as you know, in the American colonies except Pennsylvania. It may see, seem inconceivable today, but Catholics in what's now the United States and Canada were not permitted to publicly consecrate or receive the bread of life, and there was punishment that could be dire for doing so. During that era of anti-Catholic sentiment, such as, for example, in the colony of Maryland, the sons of even the wealthiest, most successful planters had limited liberties. They could not vote, they could not hold public office, nor could they practice law. Those families had to send their children to elsewhere, such as to pre-revolutionary France, for religious faith education. Three of the American sons that were sent across the seas returned home, not to sit in silence but to play major roles in shaping what would become this nation and its constitution and our heritage. Charles Carroll, who eventually took over his family's enterprises, became an early advocate of independence from the Kingdom of Great Britain. Because of his works and his writings, despite his religion, he was sent to Philadelphia, where he became the only Roman Catholic to sign the Declaration of Independence. And later, as a full citizen of the New Republic, he helped write the Maryland State Constitution, and he was elected to both the State Senate and the United States Senate at the same time. Don't ask me how he did that, Senators. <laughs> His cousin Daniel helped the framers of the United States Constitution to more fully understand issues of religious freedom, rights of conscience, and was one of only five persons and the only Catholic to sign both the Articles of Confederation and the Constitution. And we all know that Daniel Carroll's brother John in 1790 became the first Roman Catholic bishop in the United States, and he founded the first Austin Parish, as well as Georgetown, the nation's first Catholic college. And in great part, in the subsequent years of, le of legal religious liberty, which was allowed in this nation to flourish, much of that freedom was a direct result of the efforts of these and other Catholics who had stood on the front lines in the public square. But now today in 2022, many, many of those freedoms so hard fought for and won by Catholics are once again under attack, particularly marriage. And it's again time for Catholics, indeed for all Christians, for all people of faith, to act, to step boldly back into the public square to reclaim our inalienable rights that were to be protected by the First Amendment, to proclaim the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ with our words and our lives as we so do. Archbishop Charles Chaput wrote last year in First Things, Today's hostility toward those who support Catholic teaching should concern every practicing Catholic and anyone who values the First Amendment. But in response to these many challenges to marriage, many faithful Catholics and other Christians are standing on our behalf as is your bishop and many of your priests here in Lincoln. So let's focus on some shining stars and otherwise dark and murky skies, some of the heroic men and women who are standing for us in the public square. Bridget and Steve are the parents of five children. They are wonderfully faithful Catholics. They're both military veterans, and they're organic fruit farmers in rural Michigan, 22 miles outside of East Lansing. Every year after they finish their major harvest and sales, they invite St. Vincent de Paul and other local charities to come in and freely pick several tons of the remaining apples and other fruit to feed the hungry. They're really good people. 
For years, they've been welcome to bring their apples to sell at the local farmer's market. But that changed in 2017, when Steve mentioned on a private Facebook conversation that he holds to the catechism and the Catholic Church's teaching on marriage. Suddenly, East Lansing officials told him he wasn't welcome at their farmer's market anymore. They said some people don't like these Catholic teachings. They might even launch a protest, which would cause disruption in our city. Steve, who served everyone with love and grace, took his apples to the market anyway. There was not a single protest. He actually had a record sale and not a single negative comment. But that was not good enough for the local officials. Steve's enthusiasm for civilization's several thousand year old consensus on marriage was at odds with East Lansing's up to the minute views on sexual orientation, and thus he had to be punished. But there was a problem. The family's country mill farm fell outside the city's jurisdiction, so they had to come up with a new rule, one that somehow authorized them to expand their venue and to exert authority beyond their jurisdiction. Under their new highly creative legislation, the town claimed it had the right to expel their family produce from the farmer's market. Now, do a little math here. Steve violated no law in the community where he actually lives and works. He violated no state or federal laws, and he violated no actual law, even in East Lansing. He'd never been rude to anybody or, or preached to a customer or refused to cheerfully sell his apples to anyone of any persuasion or orientation who cared to buy one. But yet the leaders of this nearby city took it upon themselves to hunt him down and try to drive him out of business, simply because they disagreed with his family's adherence to our church's understanding of marriage. They were banned from the market because of believing what all of us here believe. I want to read to you just a little bit from the trial brief filed after the hearing in summer of 2021, five years after this all began, and from which we still await a ruling. Uh, I always, sometimes lay people tell me there's nothing closer to eternal life than waiting for lawyers and judges to act. <laughs> The uh, brief says, like the plaintiffs in the recent Supreme Court case, Fulton versus City of Philadelphia, many of you know that was the case that stopped the city from forcing the Catholic charities to place adoptive children with same-sex couples. <clears throat> like the plaintiffs, Steve, <clears throat> excuse me, Steve and Bridget Tennis want nothing more than to live their lives and do their work in accord with their religious faith. The state and federal constitutions guarantee them this freedom, but not East Lansing. East Lansing officials disagree with the tenants' Catholic marriage beliefs and the speech and conduct that flow from them. So they targeted them for removal from the farmer's market, changing the guidelines for that purpose, singling the farm out during the application process, and using a discretionary system of individualized assessments to ban only them from future market participation. These officials did this while publicly denigrating the tennis's religious faith and practices. Let us thank God for their courage, and as we have now passed the five-year mark, let's pray for them. The next person I want to tell you about the next story is my dear friend, Kelvin Cochran. Kelvin has uh, become a dear friend over the last decade. He tells me he grew up in uh, Shreveport, Louisiana, so poor they couldn't afford the whole word poor, and they called themselves P.O. Pope. He, uh, uh, when his father abandoned their family with several children, his single mom had to leave public housing. They moved into a shotgun shack in an alley, and uh, he experienced some of the worst forms of racism and hatred. But thanks be to God, he has no hate. He uh, once, as a small boy, saw a fire break out in another one of the shacks. He saw the firefighters rush in and save the day, and he said, Mama, when I grew up, that's what I want to be. But there was a problem. Black people could not be firefighters. Ignoring this limit, Kelvin, along with all of his siblings, got his college degree, and he pursued the appointment, scored the highest ever scored on the test, and he ultimately became the first black fireman in the city. His fellows at the fire department were very unhappy. They made him sleep in a separate location. 
They told him to wash his dishes in scalding water so they wouldn't get black cooties. And he, but he repaid their evil with good. He so excelled in his responsibilities that he was not just the first black firefighter, he became the first black captain, and eventually the fire chief. Then the city of Atlanta was in trouble, particularly with race uh, divisions, and the mayor prevailed on Kelvin to become their chief. And Kelvin, who had a policy called no-isms, brought the department into such good shape that he, the premiums of the insurance for both commercial and residential were lowered by millions of dollars for the people of Atlanta. In 2012, the National Fire Chief Magazine named him Fire Chief of the Year. His work was so effective, he caught Washington's attention, and he was appointed by President Obama to be the Fire Administrator of the United States, which is the highest position you can have in that profession, and he was unanimously confirmed by the U.S. Senate. That doesn't happen often, asked Judge Jackson. But Atlanta came calling again, begged him to return, and he did so. While he was home, he began to work on a book on his own time, at his own expense, for his church on sexual purity. He published the book, gave copies away, including to the city council and to the mayor, who apparently never read them. And a year later, they discovered that two pages of his book called for marriage to be contained within the definition of Scripture. He was suspended, investigated for discrimination, and not a single person in the entire department came forward to speak against him. In fact, many of the people of uh, different sexual orientation claims spoke on his behalf because they said they'd never worked for somebody so kind and so truly Christian and loving. And, uh, but nonetheless, he was fired. Not because he'd done anything that he was not supposed to do, but because he had the audacity to uphold marriage as between a man and a woman. And uh, so I'll not go through the literally years of litigation, but this is the one story I'm telling you that is good news because it's done and the city paid him a very large amount of money in compensation. And he's now head of the Human Resources Department for the Alliance Defending Freedom. <laughs> so, these uh, two dear young ladies, Brianna and Joanna, two faith-inspired ladies, they're of evangelical background. They were longtime friends in college, and they loved calligraphy and art. And they came up with the idea that they wanted to work together to launch an uh, artistic studio to create original art for weddings, baptism, confirmations, and other faith-based events. But the city of Phoenix did not like people like them. And Phoenix passed an ordinance whose text would force these two ladies to use their artistic talents to promote same-sex and other non-Christian ceremonies or events. The ordinance also, amazingly, the Soji ordinance, which I understand in Lincoln you've had a bit of an issue with, this ordinance also forbids them from publicly explaining what their faith requires. It cannot be posted on their website. The punishment for all of this, if you violate it, a fine of $2,500 per day of violation and six months in jail per day of violation. We'll again do a little math. You could literally, if you failed to, here I suppose you could be jailed for life because you would never, uh, done. This is the cost. Well, this is another winner. Thanks be God, the Arizona Supreme Court said this, the rights of free speech and free exercise so precious to this nation since its founding are not limited to soft mur murmurings behind the doors of a person's home or church or private conversation with like-minded friends and family. These guarantees protect the right of every American to express their beliefs in public. This includes the right to create and sell words, paintings, and art that express a person's sincere religious beliefs. With these fundamental principles, we hold the city of Phoenix cannot apply its so-called human relations ordinance to force them to create custom wedding invitations in violation of their beliefs. Their beliefs about same-sex marriage may seem old-fashioned or even offensive to some. But the guarantees of free speech and freedom of religion are not only for those who are deemed sufficiently enlightened, advanced, or progressive. They are for everyone. Thanks be to God for our state Supreme Court.
Uh, the next person you may have heard of, another long story, Jack Phillips. Jack, I suspect uh, many of you have followed his cases. He's been under persecution since 2012. That, I believe, is a decade now. He's an incredible artist in the truest sense of the word. Actually, before he opened the bakery, he was, he was an artist. And he wanted to combine the two desires and, and habits. And one of the things that was very good for us in the litigation, he had a record of 18 times he had declined to produce other cakes for other reasons. He was asked to do an obscenity, a series of obscenity. Uh, uh, I can't describe it. He declined that. He doesn't make Halloween cakes that honor witchcraft and demons. He doesn't do a lot of things. And so when two men walked in and said, we want to celebrate our same-sex marriage, and we want a special design, and we've picked you out of all the 300 and some bakers in, the, in this area of Colorado, we've picked you because we know because they knew his witness and his name, Masterpiece Cake Shop, as in the master of the universe. And uh, they said, only you can do our cake. Well, the Colorado Commission on Human Rights decreed that he was guilty of violations. They ordered him to keep a running tally of every client that came in the door, what they asked to do, what his response was, and turn that over monthly to the government. And they ordered him and his employees, including his then 90-year-old mother, to undergo government re-education to convince them that the teachings of their faith and conscience were wrong. As a result, Jack was forced out of the wedding cake business, which was over 55% of his income. And during this now decade-long fight, he and his family have suffered unimaginably. Two of my daughters flew up to Denver to spend the day with him to help him clean and redecorate his shop and provide him some new furniture. And even my daughters, uh, when they were out cleaning the windows, were subjected to drive-by cursing from people who actually screamed, uh, you're intolerant, you can't make this up. <laughs> Thanks be to God, when this case finally reached the Supreme Court in 2018, we had good news. The uh, High Court ruled 7-2 to two that the commission had discriminated itself, reversed the uh, order, and granted Jack what he thought would be some religious freedom. The very day the decree came from the Supreme Court, a person contacted his office and said, we would like you to make a new cake. We want a transition cake, uh, blue on the, outs and the inside, pink on the outside, with a very elaborate design celebrating our gender change. And of course, Jack said, have you read the paper? And they said, yeah, that's why we're calling you. And they demanded uh, he do that. Uh, the, believe it or not, the same commission that had just lost 7-2 at the Supreme Court brought a new action against Jack. We ultimately resolved that favorably. And uh, yet, lo and behold, after that was done, the third case comes. And uh, that was argued uh, in March of last year. And Jack uh, was uh, being persecuted under this same ordinance. Uh, but this time... A, a civil uh, action was brought uh, rather than the commission. I wonder how many of us would have the courage to stand for 10 years, going through all he's gone through, the, the spit, the, uh, you know, you almost, uh, during the uh, uh, readings on uh, Easter Vigil and, uh, or in Holy Week, I was thinking of Jack with the vile treatment he's received, and yet he's never responded with a word of bitterness or anger. He just prays for those that hate him. And uh, his courage has given others courage, video producers in Minnesota, wedding photographers in New York and Virginia, artists in Kentucky, and so many more. And ironically, as we wait for the ruling from the uh, Court of Appeals on the third case, the U.S. Supreme Court just days ago granted cert in this case. Lori Smith is a web designer in Colorado who, among other things, creates websites for weddings. And you, you can get, I don't even need to tell you the rest of the story, right? Uh, so Lori said she won't do those uh, things that don't honor our Lord. And uh, the case has gone forward. And now this case uh, will be argued in the Supreme Court sometime next term. And it, it involves the exact same statue that Jack Phillips has been persecuted on. So maybe she leapfrogs ahead. We may have a ruling on the ordinance, or the law, before uh, Jack's case is ever finished, which would be conclusive for him and 
literally dozens of other people across this country. You know, as Catholics, across our 2,000 years of history, which produced the litany of saints, and as the early American Carroll family legacy reminds us, Catholics have lived through some pretty trying times. We've actually had more trying times with more adversity, but empowered by the Eucharist, we've gone forward. So what I want to challenge us this morning is that we go forth from this place, recalling that without Christ we can do nothing, but through him we can accomplish all he calls us to do. And let us commit to defend, protect, and preserve marriage and the liberty of those who uphold that plan for marriage. Let's pledge to defend these clear truths, these clear principles, and not have to wait for the drawing to be done to know what's left of our rights and freedoms. And in so doing, may our good Lord bless the Diocese of Lincoln, bless and protect us, bless our marriages and our families, bless our church, and may he bless our much troubled nation. St. Thomas More, pray for us. Thank you. Yeah. I don't know what to, I didn't have a watch on, so I'm and I and I left my phone at the table, so I don't know how our time is. Uh, you know, that, that it's you, you say that just interesting question. Uh, one of the things we've done for years is teach uh, programs and granted CLE, and every state approved it until uh, in more recent years, two or three states challenged us, and so. Uh, Bottom line is we decided to challenge back in a kind way, and uh, everybody said they didn't want to go to litigation. So at this point, if you attend a CLA event uh, for ADF, you can still get CLA in every state that has mandatory CLA, but we'll see where that future is. Uh, but but uh, no CLA for this morning, I'm sorry to say. Uh, maybe you can go to the Nebraska Bar. Anybody here from the Bar Association? <laughs> Uh, yes, sir. Yeah, Mr. Sears, a uh, wonderful <coughs> presentation about your amazing work. Have you personally argued the cases in the U.S. Supreme Court? I have not. Uh, you know, this will sound really funny, but one of the themes that I had that uh, really was laid on my heart to build this uh, apostolate was this theme, and I'm actually writing a little book on it called Making Stars of Others. And there was kind of a, a thing in uh, a lot of uh, different uh, legal arenas when uh, somebody worked a case to death, they, you know, they litigated it for a year, two years, three years, got it to the appellate stage, it got snatched away. And I just, I made a decision, we were gonna be different. So everybody who worked a case up uh, under, as long as I was, uh, my, my 26 years there, uh, everyone who worked a case up got to argue the case. And uh, it was an amazing thing. And, it, it, and actually, you know, it's interesting how God works because uh, we had an individual very early on that uh, people said, well, he can't possibly do this. Well, we got the Heritage Foundation to work with us to do some moot courts, then former Attorney General Ed Meese, uh, at Bill Barr, some others got involved in helping. Uh, we had 21 uh, different organizations file amicus briefs to help. Well, this individual who was uh, called uh, incapable got a nine to zero ruling. Uh, even, uh, uh, you know, Justice uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg uh, joined in, and she was supportive during oral argument. And you know what that case was? This will blow your mind. It was the Gay Lesbian uh, Task Force of Greater Boston uh, versus Hurley. It was on whether or not you could force people to participate in the Evacuation Day Parade, which occurred on St. Patrick's Day, and won nine to zero. You can go, anybody wants to read that opinion. It's, it's an amazing thing, but it was argued by a lawyer that people said would be incapable of doing the job. It's interesting how God works. When you, you know, you honor servants. I always uh, told people, this probably didn't sound real flattering. I said, you know, if, uh, if God could use an ass, Balaam's ass, uh, to do things for his kingdom, he could even use me. So, so that's, that's my response. I, I have argued uh, many Court of Appeals cases, but I had argued them below. Yes, sir. I wanted to reflect on the 
reflect on, or just <clears throat> tell us your perspectives on that concept of common good urbanism. That uh, uh, the principles that you've been successful with and sort of maybe you got out of it. And what do you think? Where do you see this going? Well, it, the, the first question, this, I'm going to ask a question back. With all of the different writings, all the different things, I'm, I'm, I'm murky on exactly what we mean by common good conservatism because we have, you know, like articles in First Things. We've got, uh, you know, uh, the professors at Notre Dame. We've got, so I don't know how to answer your question. Uh, if maybe you could uh, ask me about a specific but the reason is these labels uh, are so casually uh, used and so many people use different versions of them. Maybe I could just get your perspective on what, what's going on in that area. Well, you know, one of the, here's the bottom line. I'm a natural law guy. Uh, you know, it's real simple. Uh, we were just upstairs in Thomas Aquinas, and uh, I think the Dominicans got it pretty good. And... Uh, you know, I'm a Robbie George guy, if that, if that helps. Uh, my son went to Robbie's Summer Institute. Robbie has taught for me on numerous occasions. We brought him to the Diocese of Phoenix for our Catholics in the public square. So that would be the view I would, I would hold. And, and, uh, and, I, and I work for Ronald Reagan. So I'm pretty traditional conservative. But I, I'm not trying to dodge your question. It's just there's... My son-in-law, he, he's the uh, executive director of Napa Legal Institute. He's actually writing an essay on this right now, talking about the five or six different definitions of modern conservatism. So, so uh, I'm not being evasive, I'm being uh, confused. <laughs> I have a question. With respect to some of these cases, was there any personal that public official? Uh, in most instances, uh, there was no uh, liability for the officials. Uh, you know, DNO insurance uh, is, is pretty good for them. Uh, and one of the things that we did early on while we were trying to establish these cases, we made a, we made a, a tactical decision. We said, we'll just ask, unless there's real damages to our client. And, and you know, yes, the... the, the uh, the Supreme Court has said any violation of the First Amendment is real damages. But if there was not a financial loss that uh, would be per like Calvin losing his job, we generally just said for a dollar. And, and it was a tactical decision because earlier in my career, before uh, ADF, when I was doing some of this religious liberty work, uh, I had uh, two or three judges said, well, you guys are just in this for the uh, money. And in one case, they, they actually had been given a fundraising letter uh, about the client I had in court. And they said, well, this is just a fundraising gimmick. You just, you know, you want this. And I said, well, let's make a tactical decision. Let's not ask for money. But more recently, uh, as these things have become more egregious, uh, that policy is changing. And you may have seen Shawnee State paid $400,000 last week to the professor who uh, was uh, subjected to uh, very adverse uh, treatment for using the wrong pronouns. So I think you're going to see more of that. It's, it's sad that we have to come to that. But again, will the individuals who did it pay that judgment? No. You know, it's, uh, you know most public officials have well insulated themselves from, from personal liability. I uh, was wondering if you would share, this is a bit off topic, but if you would share some of your experience in pornography. <clears throat> uh, well, the Attorney General's Commission on Pornography uh, was actually a, a product of a Catholic priest. Uh, Father Morton Hill, the late Father Morton Hill, uh, was uh, uh, very close to uh, uh, the Cardinal uh, Archbishop of New York, and uh, he had launched an organization. Uh, because he was very concerned about the impact of pornography on uh, everyone, but particularly on young people. And um, he and a number of others asked for a meeting with President Reagan, and the Cardinal, uh, Cardinal made a phone call to the White House. You know how that kind of works. And, uh, and Father Hill sat across the table in the cabinet room and uh, 
made a very convincing case, and President Reagan turned to Ed Meese and he said, uh, let's get a commission, let's figure out what we need to do. And, uh, and it was, uh, I was asked, I, as an assistant U.S. attorney, I was chief of the criminal section in our U.S. attorney's office, and uh, I'd had a group of citizens, this, this is TMI probably, but a group of citizens come in and dump the grocery bag of uh, the foulest stuff you could ever imagine on my desk and my U.S. attorney's desk and said, why is this in our, why are you allowing this to be sold in our district? And all we had to do was look at the covers, which I can't even describe, and we said, why are we allowing this to be sold in our district? It was clearly um, seen under the military, so we prosecuted. And we, uh, we took out uh, quite a number of the outlets and we uh, identified and prosecuted successfully the largest uh, distributor of hardcore obscene material in the world. And that was what led to me being asked by the White House to take that executive director position. We had 15 months uh, traveling in the underbelly of the country. Uh, we made a recommendation uh, to uh, Congress uh, it passed 96 to 0 in the Senate and by an overwhelming uh, margin in the House, a totally bipartisan deal. And uh, a, a task force was created that had a 90 plus percent conviction rate. Uh, we also gave, uh, we went to 22 states. 21 of the 22 states adopted our recommendations. And uh, a lot of cities, a lot of others. and. Um, uh, then we had a change in uh, presidents and a uh, new attorney general who shut down the effort. Uh, and, but during the time, it was, uh, I would say, challenging. We had a lot of opposition. That's more than you wanted to know, probably. <clears throat> yes, sir. Alan, do you have comments here on uh, practical implications? Maybe Jeopardy is a better description. Having a definition of professional misconduct includes a solely worthy. Well, if you're talking about the ABA model rule, first of all, I, I somewhat re, re, rebel at the concept of model uh, rules when they attack our most basic uh, right of conscience. I mean, this is, this ABA rule is. It, Let's just ask this, would Thomas More conform? Uh, no, I, I think it's a, an egregious, outrageous thing. Uh, I'm, as you know, I'm no longer leading ADF. I, after 26 years and some bad health, I, I thought it was time for other people to take the helm. But uh, one of the things we set up was a, a group to deal with bars, and there is expertise there. I don't know, Tom? Who's Tom been yeah. Is ADF working with you on this issue in Nebraska? Yeah. Okay, because it, uh, I just think it's a, I don't know what adjective to use that I can be quoted, uh, you know, we're, I'm being recorded, so I just say it's, it's uh, outrageous. And I would, I would give it everything I had to oppose it. Uh, because I, would, I will tell you uh, from our friends who, uh, Participate. We have a number of people who belong to the ABA and serve on a number of committees by design, and this is just the beginning of what uh, people want. This is, this is just a little foot in the door. Uh, ultimately, I'll make, I'll make a wild projection. The day will come that they would not want people who hold our view on marriage and other issues to even be members of the bar, period. Try that out for size. You can leave here and say, boy, that guy's over the top. But I've, I've heard them. Uh, many years ago, I sent uh, two individuals, uh, law professors, to uh, the King's College in London to an international conference. And they freely talked about things that are happening now. They, they basically said that people that hold uh, traditional views on marriage and sex should not be allowed to have employment. Period. And attending that conference were politicians and judges from across the globe, even a judge that was sent there by the then president. How's that for a conversation starter? Yeah. Excellency. Thank you for coming. <clears throat> great. Uh, Catholic schools, um, 
what do we need to do to prepare Um, do we, are we still pretty protected as we stick to what we do? Uh, well, you know, we, boy, long answer. A few things. On the insurance side, with the, uh, with the repeal of the conscience protection, we were talking about Matt Bowman. With repeal of some of the conscience protections for uh, medical health care professionals and other things, uh, we're going to have some insurance issues very quickly that many of the dioceses, many of the institutions, the apostolates are going to be dealing with. And uh, Napa Legal, uh, in its, this, uh, what's this, uh, in the March issue uh, of their newsletter, talks about some of the things that should be done to prepare for that time. But uh, Hosanna Tabor, which some of you are familiar with, uh, the Supreme Court dealt with the issue of religious uh, schools, who is professional. And there are, there are a number of things that every school, if they haven't done it already, should do. Uh, in the Diocese of Phoenix, uh, I was on the school board uh, for quite a number of years. We discovered we had uh, Catholic schools that had no statement of faith. We had Catholic schools that had, uh, I don't know what you require here in the way of a, of a mandatum or uh, in the position descriptions. But you know, remember that in Hosanna Tabor, the issue was, uh, does a math teacher, uh, are they a religious teacher? Uh, you know, and then, you know, how many hours a day, all this foolish stuff. Well, everybody in your institution ought to be faithful, including the custodial staff and uh, cafeteria workers, everybody else. And if, you, if your schools have not yet taken those kinds of steps, there are some very specific things that should be done, Excellency. Uh, because, uh, you know, and I don't mean any criticism, but uh, when our present bishop came in, uh, and asked me to serve on the Dawson School Board. Uh, the first two years, we had a huge fight over the definition of Catholic identity. And we, we said, we said, wrote a series of rules, and we said that every Catholic school should have something on its uh, outside to denote that it's Catholic, that it should have a crucifix and a, an image of the Blessed Virgin in every classroom, I could go on. And this was highly controversial. Uh, I, I don't mean criticism of anybody, but how would we be able to defend the, shall we say, the religiosity of the school under a First Amendment challenge if we didn't even have those kind of basic things done? I, and uh, so at this point, I, can, I, I think the Diocese of Phoenix is in pretty good shape, the 40-some schools. But, uh, so remind you uh, you, you 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 gave us a good start. Uh, you know, I, I it's uh, you know to be personal for a moment. Uh, you and I had a personal word, but uh, you all you all. I hope you understand how blessed you are to have a faithful bishop who loves the Lord, who loves the church, who has the uh, has the energy. Has the energy. Yeah, what's the point? If if we're not truly Catholic, if we're not truly faithful, why why should we spend? Uh, you know, I, I know what it costs me to have uh, four children in Catholic school at once. <laughs> it was cheaper when they went to college. <laughs> Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as was in the beginning, now and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Amen. Thank you all.